you can just go to that online. It's got a table of contents, structure index. It has thousands of protein structures and some DNA, RNA structures in various forms. And this is for educational purposes. This is a complement to the PDB or the protein data bank that the government maintains. This is run by academicians to, to illustrate different principles in biochemistry. So I like to use it. Here's a molecule that's called uh, myoglobin. Okay, It's related to a, a protein you're probably familiar with called hemoglobin. And the light blue chain here is just a long chain that's folded up. And we're just showing the alpha carbons of the peptide backbone chain. There's over 200 amino acids in this structure. It's a linear molecule. In fact, all these biomolecules in nature are essentially linear in their nature. I don't know if you've thought about that yet. You've already seen some of these molecules, but think about the ingenious design here that nature has, right? This linear combination of amino acids to put together the long chain of a peptide. In fact, the linear nature of RNA, right? The linking of the nucleic acids uh, and in DNA, right? And there you have the, the four letter code, A, T, G, and C. And in uh, peptides and proteins, we're going to have the 20 amino acids. How do we get any three-dimensional shape here? Well, uh, it folds up. So this folding issue, and we'll get into that. We'll get into the four basic levels of protein structure, primary, secondary, uh, tertiary, and quaternary structure, uh, and then cofactors. The gray uh, molecule here with this uh, brown atom right in the middle there. What's that atom? Yeah, that's iron. So myoglobin, like hemoglobin, grabs onto oxygen. That takes oxygen from the lungs and, and uh, diffuses it throughout the tissues in the body. And it also takes back uh, carbonate back to the lungs to uh, expel CO2. Uh, so a, a great design for the molecule. We call that a cofactor. It's not part of the the polypeptide or protein chain, but it's bound non-covalently into this cleft, which has shape complementarity and polarity complementarity in order to bind that uh, tightly. Myoglobins in muscle tissue, heart tissue, and also aquatic uh, mammals. We'll talk about that a little more. So you'll learn quite a bit about myoglobin here. But proteopedia is uh, the way to go. Each one of these buttons here you can click on, and then it takes you right to a new thing. So let's see, amino acids with positive charges. It should modify the structure. Oh, it's those red <laughs> amino acids now. And we'll see which ones those are, which are the positive ones. Let's see, amino acids with negative charge. What are their color? Oh, they're the blue ones, okay. Uh, the, the ones that are charged tend to be on the uh, exterior of a folded up protein. And let's see, nonpolar amino acids. You'll learn what those are, of course. Uh, let's see, it should pop up. Oh, there they are. They're the purple ones. <laughs> and they're locked into the interior of the... Uh, and that has to do with the, the protein folding, why it folds up into the tertiary 3D folded state uh, from its linear state coming off the ribosome and how it's actually made. So that's why I like to do uh, transcription and translation together. It fits in with the properties and the actual structure of the thing. So let's get rid of that. We'll go back to Proteopedia later. Uh, let's see the outline here for chapter 26, amino acids, peptides, proteins. Yeah, so we start with the 20 amino acids. So we're just adding an amine to a carboxylic acid. That's what it means, right? Alpha amino uh, carboxylic acid, carboxylate, is what our ion form, whatever. We often draw it in this, uh, this uh, projection here where you have the highest oxidized carbon, which is the carboxylate uh, at the top and then the chain coming off here at the alpha position, and then the ammonium group, or the nitrogen, is to the left. These are the L amino acids. In nature, when you put it in this projection here, the uh, amino group is to the left. And what does this mean? This projection means this. These two bonds in the horizontal plane are coming out at you. So the solid uh, wedges there, both the hydrogen and the ammonium. And then the carbons in the vertical uh, direction here. These are going back. So this means the L amino acids look like that. If you tip this on its side uh, 90 degrees and put it like that, that's how we'll often look at it. And uh, when we put together the peptides 
you'll see that's how we look at it. But there's 20 uh, amino acids in proteins typically. Some would argue there's 21 if you add selenocysteine. <laughs> Some would argue for 22 if you add in pyrolysine, which is in lower organisms. Higher animals, we're limit, we'll just stay with the 20, okay? Selenocysteine is actually coded for. Uh, maybe I'll mention that later when we get to translation, but don't worry about selenocysteine right now. We have the sulfur version right now, which is cysteine. We'll talk about that. So the nonpolar ones are glycine, alanine, valine, leucine, isoleucine. Heteroatom ones are methionine, cyclic ones, proline, aromatic ones, phenylalanine, uh, uh, tryptophan, glutamine. Uh, the, the polar non-ionizing ones are asparagine, glutamine, serine, and threonine. The acidic ones that are anionic most of the time Okay, that's because they're acidic enough and at neutral pH, pH 7, the chain will be ionized. So this chain group down here is the variation among the 20 amino acids, all the, all the common parts of the, the first two carbons in the ammonium group. But then what do we got? The acidic ones, spartic acid, glutamic acid, tyrosine, which is a phenol. Uh, that can ionize, but you have to get up above pH 10 because it is a phenol. Then we have the basic ones, uh, histamine, lysine, arginine. At normal uh, pH, those are protonated, so they'll be cationic to side chain. Oh, and then we have this. You've probably heard about this term, right? Essential amino acids. What does that mean? That means you need to get them in the diet. Higher animals do not make these synthetically in their own bodies, but plants and other organisms do make these. So the non-essential ones we can make from other metabolites in the body. But these are the essential ones. How many are there? There's nine. And I remember it from this, um, from this acronym here, which stands for the whole food ladder must have various key ingredients. <laughs> So I picture a ladder with a bunch of foods going up the ladder, and uh, this will be, what, threonine, uh, tryptophan, phenylalanine, uh, uh, leucine, methionine, histamine, uh, valine, lysine, and isoleucine. These tend to be the aromatic and the branch chain amino acids that you've probably heard about that go into muscle tissue. So if you're taking a protein supplement or amino acid booster or whatever, make sure it's got the, the, the branch chain, the BCAAs, uh, amino acids there. Those are the ones you need to get to uh, build more muscle mass. Anyway, we'll look at the PKAs, both of the carboxylic acid, the ammonia group, and the side chains, because they can be ionizable. And the PIs, or the isoelectric point, we need to look at that for each amino acid. That's the pH at which there'll be the maximum amount of neutral form for that amino acid. Now this has to do with an analytical technique called electrophoresis. We put these in electrical field and you, the different amino acids, the different pH migrates either to the cathode or the anode, depending on their charge state. So we need to know the PI and how that relates to those ionizing side chains. So the basic structures, you know, we start here with the building blocks, the amino acids, the variations for the 20 are there in the R group. We will do some synthesis, both alkylation uh, from uh, malonic uh, anion. So that ties into earlier chapter, what, chapter 24. <laughs> Uh, we'll look at, and the Strecker synthesis, which is shown here, is combining the aminium ion with the cyanide addition and then hydrolysis of the cyanide to give this. Now that normally gives a racemic form of the amino acid in nature, the L form with the S configuration, most of them. Although I should mention there's one amino acid that's L that is not S, that it's actually R. Anybody know what that one is? Okay, cysteine. We'll have to look at that. That has the sulfur, which changes the priority. It's still L. The, the, the nitrogen is still to the left. It's still the L series. But if you analyze this stereocenter there, if, if this group's higher priority than that one, it becomes uh, R uh, configuration in the absolute sense. We'll show you how to make it an antiselective, the synthesis there. Uh, and then we'll start combining them, right? We'll put uh, amino acids together and form amide bonds between them. And that's the key 
a functional group that holds together the chain here. So here's a small peptide, which has what? Five amino acids, which has alanine, serine, uh, phenylalanine. You can see the side chains changing, spartic acid, and the simplest amino acid, which does not have a stereocenter. It's the only achiral one, that's glycine. So yeah, you'll learn the one letter code for the 20 amino acids. That's how most databases are handled now. If you, if you looked at any protein sequences, or, or DNA sequences. These are uh, computerized, of course. And these sequences are kept track of in databases now using one-letter codes. So I do expect you to know the one-letter codes. So I'm <laughs> giving you a lot to memorize, sorry. Uh, <laughs> it's for your own good going forward into your other classes and in med school, dental school, you'll have very detailed classes on structures here. So. Um, <clears throat> We'll always keep it in this orientation, the N side over here on the left and the C side over here on the right. And that sequence is important. The ordering of the amino acids is the first most important thing when we put them together there. Uh, ASFDG is this structure right here, okay? Left to right, um, what, alanine to glycine. We'll look at how we can determine the sequence with a couple approaches, partial hydrolysis, and proteases, uh, carboxypeptidase, which cleaves uh, the end uh, C-terminal amino acid up, uh, trypsin, which cleaves the aromatic, or, or, or sorry, the charged amino acids, uh, arginine and lysine on the C-side, and then chymotrypsin, uh, the bigger uh, C-side of the aromatic, so it would cleave right here on this peptide because that's where phenylalanine is. Um, it would uh, hydrolyze that bond. And these proteases are amazing enzymes because they can hydrolyze amide bonds, which normally are indefinitely stable in water. They can do their work at neutral pH and cleave those very quickly. Okay, we'll have to look at their structure and how that mechanism, how we're allowing the cleavage of an amide bond with these type of structures. We'll look at peptide synthesis. In the lab, we can make these on solid support, the so-called Merrifield synthesis. With protected amino acids, we'll have to learn a couple protecting groups, and then our coupling agent will be DCC, dicyclohexacarbonate amide. We saw that before when we made esters and amides. We're making amides, so we're gonna use the uh, DCC reagent again there. And then just the basics of protein structure. This is not a biochem class, <laughs> uh, but we're gonna learn the basics, putting them together. The primary sequence is the uh, the first level of understanding, the order of the amino acids, very important. And then secondary structures are the localized structures, alpha helices, you've probably heard about those. Those are the, the twisted or corkscrew type structures in different domains of uh, proteins when they start to fold up. Beta sheets are the extended um, uh, uh, structures. These are all held together with hydrogen bonding between different amino acid side chains and the backbone. NHs, and then turns in tertiary structure. You just saw that with myoglobin, how it folds up. And then quaternary structures is where multiple proteins aggregate, come together. Now there are two basic types of proteins, fibrous, which are not soluble in water, and fortunately so, or we would all dissolve in the shower, right? So <laughs> we have these structures uh, in our bodies. It's mainly uh, keratin in hair and toenails, fingernails. And uh, what, what's the other one? Uh, collagen, which holds together ligaments and skin. Uh, so those are fibrous proteins, which are not so low. Then we have globular ones, which are ball-shaped, folded up uh, globes, you could say, um, which bury the nonpolar residues in the interior and have the on the exterior uh, the, the polar side chains. These function typically as enzymes. So you've heard of a lot of different enzymes, carboxypeptidase maybe, or pepsin, or, or, or some of these other proteases. Enzymes are used industrially and all over the place for synthesis and for some metabolism reactions, of course, and we'll learn about uh, some of those, but we'll save that for biochem class. But we'll show you how they work. The enzyme here binds to the substrate forms complex, and then often cofactors are involved like NAD or NADH, whatever, and that converts the substrate into the product, which dissociates off the enzyme. It's all an equilibrium effect, but it has to do with reactivity, basic reactivity that we've been studying all along here. All right, let's uh, look at the amino acids, the individual ones. And uh, they all have in common this basic core structure, right? 
the amine at the alpha position on a carboxylic acid. So it's okay to draw the neutral form here, and then all the variations are on the R group. And this, if you twist it around, is this L stereocenter right there, which is typically S. And we often draw the Zwitter ionic form in an aqueous solution, polar solution, it exists like that. Why? Because the base is strong enough to take that proton off. pKa here is 9, right? Ammonium cation. pKa here is around 5. Actually, it's lower in the amino acids. We'll see some specific ones here in a second. Uh, these can be as low as 2 some. And that's because of a field effect. You've got the electronegative nitrogen here. And so the carboxylate's more stabilized, which means the acid is more acidic in amino acids, okay? And we'll, we'll, we'll relate that. And then you got the issue with the ionization on the side chain, right? Let's look at the nonpolar simple ones first. We'll start with glycine. There it is, where R is just an H. So there's no stereocenter here. It's just a methylene group, two hydrogens, right? There's always one hydrogen there, this one. But now in glycine, we have the second one. And the glycine's the name. Gly is the three-letter code, which is kind of archaic. Uh, what we use now is just G for it, okay? You see a G <laughs> in biology, biochemistry, it means glycine, okay? Then we got alanine. We've got a methyl group now for R. So now we have a stereocenter, alanine or ala or just A, okay? And then we have valine, which has an isopropyl group. Okay, there it is, three carbon group. It still has these two groups, of course, these two carbons. So it's a total of what? Five carbons in valine now. And uh, val, okay, comes from valeric acid, which is a five carbon carboxylic acid, but valine is the name of this amino acid now. These are all accepted by the IUPAC. And then V is just the uh, one letter code. And just think of isopropyl. You're making the V or the peace sign, right? So you've got the, uh, the branch thing there and uh, valine. Uh, is it an essential amino acid? Yeah, various uh, <laughs> food groups. The whole food ladder must have various key ingredients. And the V stands for that one. And then we got leucine. Uh, it's got LEU for its... Uh, Three-letter code, and then just L here. And what type of group is that? Well, that's a four-carbon side chain. That's a, we've seen this before, that's a isobutyl side chain, right? <laughs> isobutyl alcohol or whatever. We, we have a branch point there. So it's similar to valine. It's got the V-shaped structure, the isopropyl, but it's got an extra methylene right there. Okay. And then we have isoleucine which has a secondary butyl group here, and that has another stereocenter. It is S. Don't worry about that. Um, draw it either way. Isoleucine or just I, okay? But ironically, that's the sec butyl <laughs> side chain. The isobutyl one is leucine. So sometimes I mix those up <laughs> because I learn the butyl <laughs> common names first. But yeah, what you'll notice here is there's no tert butyl side chain. There's no ethyl side chain. There's no straight chain butyl, no straight chain propyl. So there's a lot of simple chains that could be there, but they're not. Nature has selected these, okay? And then we got the, uh, the cyclic amino acid, which is a secondary amine. This is proline or P, okay? And this will form secondary amides. So this has another alkyl group on it. It has the uh, pyrrolidine heterocyclic ring here. But if you got the alpha amino acid, and that is at the alpha position, but it's just uh, cyclized around there, proline. Proline's kind of a unique amino acid for another reason, not just because it's cyclic. It also breaks up alpha helices and beta sheets. It tends to hang out at turn regions within folded up proteins. Then we got methionine, which is a methyl sulfide ethyl side chain, met or M. Okay, so those are all straightforward, G-A-V-L-I-P-M methionine, and considered to be nonpolar. Then we got the aromatic ones here. We've got phenylalanine. So P-H-E or F, phenylalanine. P was already taken for proline, so it's not P, it's F for phenylalanine. And why the name here, alanine? Well, alanine is a methyl group on the amino acid, and there it is. It is alanine, but the alanine has a phenyl group on it, okay? It's not benzyl. 
although you could call this benzyl glycine. <laughs> there was some debate about naming phenylalanine in the early days. Do we call it benzyl glycine or phenylalanine? Phenylalanine won out. Uh, the phenyl group is the benzene substituted on alanine. F, aromatic, nonpolar. Then we got tryptophan, which has the indole heterocycle here, also considered nonpolar and non-ionizing. Well, you have a lone pair here. Is this a mean basic at all? No, <laughs> that's a proline lone pair, right? Here's the parole uh, chain and the benzo group on it. The whole thing together is called indole, and that lone pair is part of the aromaticity, so it's never protonated, okay? It's neutral. Tryptophan, that's a weird one. T is taken by threonine. Uh, we'll show you that in a second. So they call it W. Do you see a W in the name here? No, you don't. So why are they calling this W? That's because when Elmer Fudd pronounces this name, he doesn't say tryptophan. What does he say? Twiptophan. <laughs> no, I don't know. I've heard a lot of biochemists joke about this. Twiptophan, and that's the W. Uh, it's kind of arbitrary there, but W uh, stands for uh, tryptophan, which is that amino acid with the methyl group and then the indole uh, for this R group right here, okay? Then we have histidine. We'll uh, see this one in the ionized state or aromatic. So some of them fit in multiple groups. The pKa is six here, which means if you're at pH seven, this will be ionized, okay? This is very close to pH neutral seven. This is the proton shuttle side chain. And we'll see this also interacting with iron in, uh, in hemoglobin. It actually can, can bond with the lone pair uh, toward iron. It helps regulate the affinity of oxygen uh, to iron in uh, hemoglobin. But that's histidine, uh, H, that's good, so H, uh, F. So that's the only one that's straightforward, I'd say. <laughs> And then we got the phenol one, the hydroxyphenylalanine, you could call this. But once you put that hydroxy group on phenylalanine, that becomes tyrosine, T-Y-R or Y. And luckily there's a Y in the name, so it helps remember it. Um, uh, PKA though of 10, which means you have to be super basic to get that ionized. Normal conditions, these guys will always be neutral here. And even this one, at pH 7, histidine will be neutral also. So those are all in the aromatic grouping. And then we got the polar non-ionizable. They have polar groups in the side chain, but they don't ionize. So we have asparagine, which has an amide here. Uh, it comes from aspartic acid. It's the amide version of aspartic acid. And uh, asparagine, luckily it has an N in it. Uh, a was taken by alanine, so the one letter code's N for asparagine. Uh, it's actually abundant in a vegetable that maybe you're aware of. Which is it? Yeah, asparagus. <laughs> okay. Glutamine is the amide form of uh, glutamate, uh, GLN. G was taken by glycine, so they stuck Q on it. Don't ask me why. <laughs> I don't know, not for Quincy Jones, the musician. No, sorry, uh, Q, kind of random there, but Q for glutamine. And unfortunate term here, glutamine, it's not an amine, it's an amide. Sorry, uh, they mess up some names now and then. Then we got the hydroxyalanine, which is serine, which is a primary alcohol. Okay, you could call that hydroxyalanine uh, or methylhydroxyglycine, I guess. Primary alcohol, serine is very abundant and very common in the active sites of different enzymes as a primary alcohol, uh, nucleophilic oxygen. Then we have threonine, which is like isoleucine, has another stereocenter. The stereocenter is actually R. It's a secondary alcohol, has an extra methyl group compared to serine. And there's the T, okay? So that's why uh, tryptophan is W. Uh, T was already taken by threonine. Okay, so those are polar groups where they don't ionize them. And they say, well, can we donate a proton off the alcohol? Well, the pKa of an alcohol is 15. That's outside the pH range. So normally it's always uh, protonated. We'll see it be able to come on and off, uh, different mechanistic things if it's involved in the active site. But normally if it's not participating uh, in its you know, neutral pH or so, regular pH, 0 to 14, it's always protonated. Same thing here. These don't come off. The pKa's here are around 20, 25 for an amide. 
these alpha protons are very high also. So these stay on there. Okay, so we got asparagine N, glutamine Q, serine S, and T for threonine. Sorry, we're not done. <laughs> There's a lot of these. These graphics are on Learning Suite too, and there are different charts in your book, and you can find them all over the internet too. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going through them systematically showing you how I, I try to keep track of them. But again, all the common things here, here's how the R groups change. Aspartic acid, acidic side chains, these are anionic at pH 7. So here's the ionized side chain, an extra carboxylate. This is on the side chain, right? So aspartic acid, it comes from succinic acid. In fact, you could call aspartic acid, what, amino succinic acid, okay? Aspartic acid, A was already taken, so they stuck a D on it. Aspartic acid, well, at least there's one D there in the acid name. It's D, sorry. Or aspartic, if you kind of emphasize the soft T there as a D sound. That's how I try to remember it. The side chain ionized at 3.7 pKa, so it's also ionized at pH 7. And then glutamic acid, uh, G was already taken by glycine, so what do we call it? E. Do you see an E here in the name? No, you don't. So why are they calling it E? Well, you should remember what? The neurotransmitters. What's the most potent excitatory neurotransmitter? Yeah, excitatory. Glutamic acid in the synapse is that neurotransmitter. Of course, it's in proteins too, and that's via the, the translation process though on the ribosome. So. Uh, it's in a different state there. It's not excitatory if it's in a protein. But in the free state, in the synapse, this is the excitatory neurotransmitter. So I stuck an E on it for its single letter name. The side chain is three is 4.3. It's a little more remote from the, um, from the amino carboxylate part here. So it's a little bit closer to the pKa of a normal carboxylic acid around five, okay? The closer you are to the ammonium group here, the more acidic you are. And so you see aspartic acid's more acidic side chain than the glutamic acid. And then we have the uh, cysteine. You probably heard about this one. This forms the disulfide linkages. It's the only other covalent interaction in proteins. Uh, the, the sulfurs can dimerize and form a disulfide linking, uh, strengthening the folded up protein state. Cysteine, CYS, and luckily, yeah, C is available. So. Uh, this can be ionized, but it's super high pH, right? Super basic. So normally it's neutral right there. Then we have the basic side chains, which are cationic, lysine, uh, and yeah, L is taken, so K. <laughs> uh, PKA has a high PKA. Maybe that's how you can remember it. Uh, ammonium cation, there it is. It's an alkyl uh, amine. So electron-rich amine, so yeah, it has a high pKa. Normally, it's always ammonium salt. It's always protonated. And then we have the one that you have, has an even higher pKa. This is the pirate amino acid. Why do we call it the pirate one? Because it's arginine. Arge, and that's a guanidinium group, which due to resonance effects, uh, protonated, this cationic form has all sorts of resonance structures, which makes it, what, even more basic, even less acidic. So uh, look at it in different ways there. So did we do all of them? Let's see. Well, there were 20, right? Let's see if we got them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. I think we got them all. <laughs> so if you link them together by their properties, and when we say nonpolar versus polar, what do we mean there? These are all soluble in water, but the side chains change their polarity. So glycine's a very polar molecule. It's very soluble in water, but we stick it in the nonpolar group because it has an extra carbon hydrogen bond, which that bond itself is nonpolar, okay? And these other ones have big nonpolar groups, right? So that, that's why we're calling it that. It's, it's the polarity of the side chain, and that'll have an important impact on the folding coming up later, okay? And then the other ones to keep track of are, are the, uh, the ones that are negatively charged, right, that are acidic, and then the basic ones that are uh, protonated under normal conditions. All right, we'll get into the synthesis uh, and do, do some on that today. We still have a little bit of time. Let's, uh, let's start that at least. Um, well... 
Now let's review a little bit more on PKAs first. So if we come over here in the sideboard, uh, Aaron. So yeah, let's go over the sideboard. And let's look at the ionization state of some of these. Um, and, you know, we've done this a couple different ways here. So which amino acid is that? Yeah, it's glycine. And let, let's put it on the chart here from 14, 7, and uh, 0. And we need to look at the specific PKAs here. The PKA of this carboxylic acid is 2.34. Now, why is that so much lower? And we're showing the, the conjugate base of it. We're ionizing it already. If you put a proton there, that proton has a pKa of 2.34. Why? Because it's an next door to an ammonium cation. Okay, so it's more acidic. Okay, and what about this ammonium cation? Let's get the specific one there. Yeah, it's 9.6. It's around 9. Okay, <laughs> so I wasn't lying to you. Maybe we were lying about these. Okay, these are a lot lower than 5. I kept telling you 5 for carboxylic acid. <laughs> these are more acidic. Why? Because of the field effect of the adjacent ammonium guy. And let's see. Let's put it in different. Uh, pH is here. So let's say we have it below two here. So this is super acidic, right? Uh, one molar uh, ammonium cation is zero, right? pH. So if we're down here at one or near zero, and yeah, you can even get to negative values of the pH scale. And if we're at that point, right, this ammonium group will still be there and the carboxylate will be protonated now. So the overall charge of glycine in this domain is what? Plus one, okay? Now this has an impact on how they're characterized and purified. So yeah, you need to keep track of this. And the other number, P PKA, so here's our PKA, right? 2.34. Let's go up here to the basic side of this PKA in this region and you know, 9.6 whatever is the other one. Well, let's draw it up here. Let's keep the pKa's on the top, the pH on the bottom there. So in this domain right here, what do we have? Well, we have this form, right? This witterion form of glycine. And what's the charge there? Yeah, zero overall, okay? Well, let's go up here to the super basic side, and then we can ionize the ammonium group finally, right? This stays as an anion. This becomes neutral now. We have enough base strength to pull it off. So what's the overall charge here? Yeah, minus one. Okay, let's define the other factor here, which is PI, isoelectric point, and that's the max neutral, right, of your amino acid uh, pH-wise, okay? So at what pH will we get the maximum amount of neutral form of glycine? Well, it'll be somewhere above 2.34. We've got to go above that, right? and we got to stay below 9.6. So what do we get to? We take the two ionizing groups that give us the neutral form here, and we just average those. So it's equal to 9.6 in this case, plus 2.34 divided by 2. We take the average of it, right? And so what do we get here? 5.97, <laughs> we get 6. The neutral side chain ones are all about six. They vary a little bit depending on the specific PKs. If we ask you a specific problem, we give you the PKs. Don't memorize these PKs. <laughs> know them roughly, but know what the PI means. So this maximum amount would be right here at, 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 uh, at six, right, for the PI. And that's where we'd have the maximum amount. If we go a little bit more acidic, we start to get more of this, more protonated form. If we go a little bit more basic side of the PI, we start to get more of this. But the maximum amount will be this, okay? This is all equilibrium stuff anyway. Let's look at a couple other amino acids real quick here to wrap up with. Let's look at uh, which one? Let's look at, uh, uh, sorry, we got to erase a few things here. Let's look at, um, Let's see, which one do I want to do? Oh, lysine, it's okay. And we have the ammonium, and we have the uh, butyl chain, and then we have the ammonium, and that. So I'm drawing it in the ionized uh, form there. The pKa's for all these are known, 2.2 for that one, 9 for this one, and 10.8 for this one, okay? This one's a little 
uh, less basic. It's a little more acidic than this one because of the field effect of this. So they mitigate a little bit there. So lysine, let's go through the different spots here. So yeah, we're down here at two or so. And if we keep it super acidic, what are we gonna have? We're gonna have these still protonated. And what? We can even protonate the carboxylate. So what's the overall charge of lysine at super low pH? Well, it's overall plus two. Okay. Now let's go above two in this range right here. And that's a big range. We've got nine, and then we've got another one here. We've got 10.8, another pK, right? So we've got a couple different domains now. So this middle domain here between two and nine, let's see we're around here. What are we going to get? We're going to get uh, this one coming off, and that, that's going to be the form, right? <laughs> so what's our overall charge there? Well, plus one, plus one, and then minus one. So what does that come out to be? Plus one, okay? For that range. And <laughs> that's at neutral pH, right? It's going to be plus one charge. And here it is, okay? That's different than glycine, right? Let's go up here at nine. Let's maybe go to 10, okay, on this uh, pH range. What's the structure going to look like here? Well, one of these is going to come off. Which one's going to come off first? We've already got this one off. We're on the basic side of that one. Which one's next? This one would be the next one to come off, right? This is more acidic than this one. So what do we get in this range? It's kind of a narrow range, right? This one will still be protonated, but that one will be off now. And that one's off too. But you see, kicking it off a of carboxylic acid gives you the negative charge. So look, between nine and 10, or 11, let's say, you know, it's close to that pK. This region right here around 10, what's it going to look like? Yeah, it's going to look like that. This one's going to be neutral. <laughs> Minus one, plus one, what's the overall charge? Yeah, zero. Okay. <laughs> plus two, plus one, zero, pretty narrow range. And then way up here, what's it going to look like up here? Well, yeah, this one's going to come off then. <clears throat> going to have this, carboxylate. Both neutral, what's the overall charge? Negative one. All right, here's the little tricky part. What's the PI for lysine? And again, what's the definition of PI? The pH that gives you the maximum amount of neutral. Well, you can already tell, where's it gonna be? Is it gonna be down here around six, like you saw before with glycine? No, because we've got the two cationic groups here. It's when the first one falls off, right? because that becomes neutral, and then these two cancel each other out. It's the neutral form, the isoelectric point. It's going to be the average of the two that are involved in giving you the neutral state, right? And that's these two right here, 10.8 uh, plus 9 divided by 2, right? Because when this one comes off, then you got the neutral, okay? So it's always the two like charges that you need to... Uh, average here in this case. So what's the uh, number here for this? 9.9 uh, .9, or right around 10, <laughs> okay, the isoelectric point. And you see that's this form right here, right? So you're averaging these two cationic ones. We don't average in this one, okay? So that's the difference there. You always average the two like charges there to get the PI for an ionizable group. So it's way up here. You have to be very basic in order to have this in neutral form and not, not migrating in the electric field. <laughs> if you're on the acidic side, it's, uh, it's cationic, and it'll migrate toward the, the cation, the cathode in the electrical field. If it's anionic, it'll, it will migrate toward the anode. Um, and, and that's the basics of electrophoresis, too. And I'm not going to do that. I used to show some graphics of the electrophoretic effect. But we'll just stick with isoelectric point. And, and you can see that'll change the ionization state. And if you had a bunch of these amino acids at different pHs, you could kind of see how they would migrate. It's on an auger plate. And uh, you can actually stain the amino acids and see where they end up after you turn off the electrical field. So, yeah, don't worry about electrophoresis. Uh, worry more about the structure in the isoelectric point. Um, let's do one more, maybe. How about uh, glutamate? Let's uh, modify our 
structure here. And let's see which ones we need to do here for glutamate. So glutamate's E, the excitatory guy. Got uh, carboxylate, <clears throat> uh, ammonium, and another carboxylate. Okay. So yeah, we have the side chain here with three more carbons and the carboxylic acid, which is ionized. Uh, that's glutamate. And we need to know the pKa's here. This one's 2.2 again. This one's 9.7, very close again. And this one's 4.3. We already saw that kind of. So let's be down here at one or zero. What are we gonna have? We're gonna have uh, the ability to protonate both of these, right? Protonate everything. <laughs> okay, so what's the overall charge here if we're down here at zero or one? It's gonna be what? Uh, plus one, okay? So a little bit different, right? And then the difference here is between two and four, right? So here's our narrow range between the two like charges. So let's see, which one is going to get uh, protonated first? So, well, yeah, it's going to be what? The, 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 uh, the more uh, basic one that has the lower, the lower pKa, right? So for right here, what are we going to have? This one's still on the... On the uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> this one's gonna protonate first. We're on the acidic side of its pK. This one, you see, we're, we're still on the, uh, the, the, the basic side of it. So let's make sure we got the right one here. <laughs> so yeah, that one's more, more acidic. So if we go past two here, we're gonna ionize that one, okay? I think I got that right. <laughs> and so uh, what's our charge here in this range? Well, negative and plus, this one's now protonated, okay? Why? Because it's 4.3. And so the overall charge here is zero, okay? And that tells you something about the PI right away. You can already tell where we're going to be. And let's go four to nine here. And so now we're going to protonate uh, which one? We're going to uh, have this one still deprotonated. But you see, we're... we're uh, basic enough to have that one ionized, and that's this form we're already showing here. So at pH 7, you see, it would be this form, ionized there, ionized there. We're on the basic side of both of these pKa's. We're on the acidic side of that one, right? So what are we overall here? We're negative 1, okay? And let's go beyond 9 here. So above 9, we'll have minus there, and we'll have uh, neutral here. <laughs> and negative there. So the overall charge here above 10, let's say, will be uh, what? Uh, um, minus two, okay? So where is our PI, our isoelectric point? And what are the two uh, pKa's we need to average here? Well, here's our two like charges, right? Which when one comes off, the thing gets neutral, right there, right? So here's the one coming off, the more acidic one, okay? That gives us our neutral form. So what are the two we're gonna average here? Right, it's 4.3 plus 2.2 divided by two, and so what's the average come out to be? Two, okay? So um, yeah, you can see, oh, no, sorry, three, 3.2, sorry, got the wrong number there. So 3.2, right around here, right? That's the isoelectric point because what? That's the range where you get the maximum amount of neutral. So you always average the two uh, that have like charges within the pH range. The protonated uh, neutral side chain ones like phenol, asparagine, uh, glutamine, you, you don't mess with those pKa's, okay? Uh, the phenol one uh, is protonated and neutral at pH 7. So you don't worry about that for, uh, for tyrosine. Um, yeah, I, I think there's some other problems like that. So yeah, I think we're good uh, at that point. Let's uh, wrap things up.
Uh, make sure you know the names and the structures related to the polarity of the side chains. Review your PKA stuff. The isoelectric points, the new thing. We'll get into the synthesis. We'll review naming a little bit. We'll get into peptides, of course. And eventually, the second hour next time, we'll get into proteins. We'll revisit myoglobin and, and look at the different structures of the proteins. Check out Proteopedia if you want and get the supplement book if you'd like there, but, but you don't need it. Um, I'll, I'll give you plenty on the handouts of what you need to know there for the, for the biomolecules. So, so very good. We'll see you next time.